Okay, we are live. Guys, thank you very much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, today is going to be a great learning experience for me as well because uh, today I'm very happy to have Dr. Rajvedam back on the show. Uh, Dr. Rajvedam was here before as well and I had a very enlightening chat with him and I'm very happy that he's back here because we're going to be talking about the Aryan invasion theory and you know the, the 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 reason why the Aryan invasion theory is still propagated but before we really jump into the nitty-gritties of it uh, please welcome back to the show Dr. Raj Vedam. Thank you thank you Sean and thank, uh, thank you to our listeners for joining in. All right fantastic so uh, Dr. Vedam let's just jump into it because you know it's it's very interesting the when we see the kind of material that is coming from the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory because generally speaking at least in the last few years when we hear about these people talking about the Aryan invasion theory and saying that oh no the Aryan invasion theory is completely real we usually see them talking about only genetics because before they used to talk about linguistics they used to talk about um, hydrology astronomy archaeology but now there's just a mountain of evidence that is piling up on all these fronts uh, disputing the Aryan invasion theory. So people, at least the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory, are more and more hesitant to go down those routes. So now what they're doing is they're, they're solely almost focusing on the genetic route. And so let's maybe start with the background of the genetic argument for the Aryan invasion theory. What is a the genetic argument for the Aryan invasion theory and, and, and you know what's the background of it and why is there not yet a consensus within the scientific community with this question? Okay, thanks, John. So let, let me uh, recap what you asked sure. and perhaps go a little behind also, starting historically about the identity question of Indians. So the Westerners have been interested in trying to understand who are the Indians. Right. And ever since, like I say, William Jones discovered the commonality of uh, Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, they have tried to address a question. And naturally, because linguistics was the first frontier that they encountered, they started looking at the linguistic evidence. And right. they sooner or later, they found that these languages are related. <clears throat> and once they found the languages are related, they asked, how could this be? And one potential way it could have happened is, if they were the so-called Aryan people, who were common between the Europeans and the Indians. If right. that was true, then that will account for at some point in the past, they shared a common language, and these are the daughter languages of that ancient language. So the linguistic line of thinking eventually gave rise to this construction of this uh, hypothetical, mythical, uh, Proto-Indo-European language, right. which is the ancestor of all these uh, so-called Indo-European languages that you see today. So this is the uh, hypothesis started with. And sooner or later, European scholarship uh, um, centered, located, geologically located this ancestral language uh, somewhere between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And uh, soon after, they started trying to explain how these migrations might have happened. In the Indian context, once they found uh, the Indus Valley, Harappa, the remains of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, then uh, the archaeologists at that time, because on the evidence of finding some uh, skeletons over there that seemed to show signs of distress, right. they quickly proclaimed it was an invasion. It was an invasion that came. The Aryans invaded India and look at all their poetry and other such things. Wherever you look, it's a warlike culture. So right. they have a war-based philosophy. And these guys came to Indus Valley and they destroyed the existing people. Look at the Rig Veda talks about Dasyus mm -hmm. and gods killing Indra going and killing them. So all these were convenient uh, crutches that they used to construct a edifice of something they called an Aryan invasion theory. However, the theory was challenged early on by Indic people themselves. For example, there was a gentleman called um, Dikshit, and mm -hmm. there was a gentleman called, of course, everybody knows Balagangadhar Tilak. So they were Sanskrit scholars, and they looked at evidence for astronomical observations in our ancient texts, and they chanced upon several of them, and so did the British. 
even the british chanced upon the kali yuga episode which was dated to 3102 bc the planetary clustering in revithi nakshatra right. they discovered that and then uh, they found about the shatapatha brahmana that talks about kritika never swerving from the east and they said that date is around 2960 bce and they started saying wait a minute if you're going to postulate an aryan invasion theory in the time frame of 1500 bce we have evidence in india of uh, of as a vedic phenomena if i can call it that uh, mm-hmm. as uh, oops of this Max Müller was aware of this. Max Müller was one of the ones who was the proponents of this Aryan invasion theory and all this associated rubbish on the strength of his having uh, translated many of the Sanskrit works. He wrote a book in 1862 or so where he addressed the astronomical question, what do we do with that? Given that our models are talking about an invasion in 1400 or 1500 BCE, what do we do with this? he relied on flimsy crutches from somebody called um, bentley and uh, a couple of other people who were trying to discredit the indic astronomy and he also made use of a data point by a scholar called colebrook who must right. have lived about maybe 80 to 100 years before max miller colebrook had pointed out a phenomena in the vedanga jyotisha which comes to around 1400 bce Max Müller accepted only that. Right. He said I'm going to accept Kolbrook's measurement of 1400 BCE in the Vedanga Jyotisha. I'm going to discard all the other inconvenient data points. Note this, discard the inconvenient data points, only selectively take what suits my narrative and go ahead with this Aryan invasion. So this is how Max Müller close the chapter on astronomical data being used he right. said they were all unreliable you can't use earlier texts they are all unreliable but so by saying so he set a trajectory where even today's indologists right. dare not use anything from the texts because max miller has set the edict over here that these are all unreliable and therefore we're not going to use it any further so this is the situation that uh, 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 historians found themselves in then coming on much later a scientist in the in the later periods of time meaning closer to our own times they found that the indus valley was not overrun by aryans rather there was climate change in that area yes a climate change of almost maybe 100 or 200 here year hiatus in the monsoons that is what caused the drying up of the uh, region drought a uh, widespread drought and that caused migration of people from indus valley so one once got to realize some of these realities that are there encoded in science and how it doesn't align with this hmm. so that started the opening of the scientific narrative can we look more in science and today there are a whole lot of indic researchers who are trying to go in and look at the hydrology of the river systems the time to look at mentions in the in the vedas themselves in the linguistic evidence what does it talk about other such things so once they found that uh, astronomy is inconvenient they moved on to archaeology mm-hmm. so archaeology was convenient for people like maria gimbutas and for uh, colin renfro who started saying that if you look in central asia for records of archaeology that ties up with linguistics we had a skurgan culture over there yeah. or colin renfro came and said anatolian uh, agriculture having been invented there that those are the issues that we need to worry about bottom line they said that this evidence of kurgan culture moving out according to uh, uh, maria gimbutas in three waves and in one of those waves last wave was aryan invasion theory that was right. the thesis call it agriculture and around 7000 bce or something like that and the migration of the people along with agriculture to rest of the world provided the impetus for language hmm. so this is the dominant thinking moving on as of today however the inconvenient data points are that one i told about the climate change records that we have found two the hydrological research that is coming about the saraswati river right. about uh, the river channels of satluj and other other, other such things third thing is archaeology in birana that is mm. now going to an exceedingly ancient period of time 
Fourth is the research being done by uh, the Sahni Institute of Paleo Sciences, where they're talking about um, rice paddy cultivation, paddy cultivation in the Ganga Plain, and they're finding evidence that it is a pretty ancient uh, uh, piece of evidence. Wow. Then you come to other inconvenient data points like uh, what is the DNA of the mouse, what is the DNA of the cow, and where is their ancestral DNA. All of those pointing to India, mm. which if you take the paddy research, the mouse, the cow and everything and put them together, join the dots, it says agriculture probably originated in India and went out to the rest of the world. Right. So this is a long prelude to what you asked. So here's where we are today. Confronted with all of this evidence, people don't want to open new battlefronts. So the researchers go to a very narrow specialization. They look at genetics and say, in the context of genetics, I'm going to ignore that these other things exist. I'm going to talk only about genetics and what does it say. And by the way, in the course of this talk, I will show that genetics is not a standalone field. Right. Genetics makes use of field data. Genetics makes use of uh, lab work. Genetics makes use of mathematical work. And finally, interpretation. These are the four things that are needed in, a, in a, any paper that or claims you see in genetics. So. When we talk about models, I will show that they use certain narratives from our uh, from the history, the so-called histo historical narratives. They privilege a certain narrative as a model <laughs> based on which they'll conduct their genetics research. It's a circular argument. And yeah. I hope by the end of our talk, it will be clear what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Over yeah. to you. No, sure. definitely. And so I think uh, a good idea now would be now that we've looked at the sort of background of the Arden invasion theory, the reason it's come about, what are the various arguments that are offered, and the, you know, the amount of evidence that is building up, the multifaceted evidence that is building up against this argument as well. So now I think it would be, uh, you know, interesting to get a primer on genetics for like a lay listener or a lay observer like myself, and I'm assuming, you know, many people in the audience as well. Sure, yes, I, outstanding idea. I'm now going to share a slide, so Sham, if you can share yes, my will, slide. So guys, I have a bit of a visual treat for you guys as well. So uh, in my window, the, those that are watching will be able to see a slide uh, that uh, Dr. Vedam has prepared as well. So you'll be able to follow exactly what Dr. Vedam is saying by taking a look at the slides. And people who are going to be listening to it on a podcast, we will also, please don't worry, we will also try our best to make sure that you don't feel left out. And we will try and explain uh, to the best of our ability what's present on the slides as well. So you can easily follow along as well. So I'll just grab that and pull that here. Hopefully everybody can see this. And I'm just going to share the screen. So over to you, Dr. Vedam. Okay, Sean, thanks. So I'm now sharing a slide that gives a brief high school level primer on genetics. What is this all about? We need to understand this background to understand how the rest of the advanced research has been done. So all of us have learned about uh, DNA, which is a double helix built up of nucleotide molecules. And they have these base blocks, which we all know by the acronyms A, C, T, and G. And, and we know that uh, the genes, the so-called genes, are hereditary units that are built of DNA. And there is some controversy even today how many there are in the human body. It's not a settled question. So we can safely say between 20,000 to 21,000 genes is what scientists today speculate are uh, present as hereditary units in the human body. And the chromosomes are the last level in this hierarchy, genes to uh, DNA to genes to chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of genes. Mm -hmm. That's one way to look at it. And we all know from high school that uh, in the humans, we have about uh, 23 pairs of uh, uh, chromosomes, where 22 are what are called autosomes, and two of them are the sex chromosomes, the X and, a, and, and Y. The female comes with the XX chromosome, the gender chromosome, and the male comes with the XY chromosome. Right. So their offspring, if it is a daughter, the daughter always gets one X from the mother and always gets one X from the father. And if it is a son, the son always gets the X from the mother and the Y from the father. So this is a typical inheritance profile of, uh, uh, of chromosomes. And typically during the stage of uh, meiosis, there is recombination that takes place and there is uh, some error correction and all those kind of things. But bottom line is our understanding is 
we get almost exactly the same genetic copy going back to our earliest ancestors. That said, I think uh, uh, we can wave our hands and say 99.9% of us carry exactly the same uh, uh, DNA content. Right. And all the differences that we see, morphological, uh, 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 the phenotype, and all, all those kind of things are based on the 0.1% of uh, difference. That is what accounts for all the differences. And why do these differences come? That I tried to explain in the next slide. We're in talking about uh, uh, chromosomal mutations. Now, when, when, when chromosomes go through the process of uh, being copied, uh, it is not an exact copy. Sometimes right. a portion of it can be deleted. Sometimes a portion of it can be duplicated. Sometimes this portion can become inverted in the copy. Sometimes an insertion can happen. Some, uh, this portion can be inserted somewhere else. Sometimes a translocation, it might go to some completely different slide. So scientists have in, I've seen a number of mechanisms by means of which some chromosomal mutation can happen and what they call genetic drift and all of these phenomena ensures that there's going to be some level of difference between uh, some some generations but these are very very small nevertheless however these differences allow scientists to identify what they call as markers and that is used for chromosomal research now we'll find that people generally talk about maternal mitochondrial DNA for the most part. And why is that? What is so important about that? It's at least necessary to understand at a very basic level why maternal mitochondrial DNA. And so this now, is this is one of the big pieces of, you know, quote unquote evidence that the proponents use uh, to, right. you know, for the Arden invasion theory is the study of maternal mitochondrial DNA. Precisely, along with the Y chromosomal and the genome-wide research, this was the earliest research was done with maternal mitochondrial DNA. So in the primer, it's good to understand what is this mito what what is this all about. So it turns out that the mitochondria is supposed to be an alien cell which is captured by the humans or some other biological entity at some ancient point in the past, and we have inherited ever since. But it exists independently inside the cells that we carry. Now, it turns out that the mitochondria is the battery of the cell. It is an energy source that gives energy for the cell's functioning. In the, uh, in the sperm, it turns out that the payload of the sperm is in the head, and just behind that is the battery. And this battery is the mitochondria, right. and this powers the tail. And the tail has got to swim through uh, the, the, the medium and then reach the egg. That is the bottom line. That's a function of this mitochondria in the sperm. However, when it meets the egg, what happens is only the payload is allowed to enter the egg mm. and the tail is jettisoned. So when the tail is jettisoned, even the male mitochondria is not allowed to enter the ovum, mm. which means the chromosomes on the in the sperm are allowed to uh, go in for the recombination however when the cell divides and we inherit the cells we only get the maternal mitochondrial dna which means the mitochondria that was there in the female egg does not get a counterpart from the male mitochondria to fuse and other such things mm -hmm. only that will be inherited by future generations. In other words, so it provides a nice mechanism to trace back at least the female ancestry to an exceedingly ancient period of time. Wow. That is the bottom line. So uh, that is a very brief background on uh, high school uh, level biology genetics on right. what is chromosome genetics, DNA, why maternal mitochondrial DNA. Right. It is it is interesting, right? Uh, and so when they when they use the study of mito, uh, you know, maternal mitochondrial DNA, what did they find? Excellent question. Excellent question. So before that, before that, uh, um, Sham, I'd like to give you a brief uh, uh, introduction into um, how do you even use the DNA for mi migration studies. True. That that's a good starting point. To even talk about I that. Agree. So so like I said, ninety nine percent of us share the same DNA. I hope you can see my slide. Yes, I'll, I'm going to bring it up now. I'm going to bring it up just in one second. Uh, right, here we are. Okay, 
So it turns out that around 99.9% of us share the same DNA. And like I said, the differences are about 0.1%. We essentially get the same copy of chromosomes in the male and female lineages. However, I talked to you about the small mutations mm. drift that occurs over several generations. And these are in, inherited by the descendants. In other words, let's assume you have a lineage that goes along like this, then there's some significant drift over here. So all the future here carries perhaps this drift and this one continues in some other frame somewhere else. Unless there was genetic ex material exchange between this line and this line, mm. only this line will carry the mutation. Right. So that is the, that is the idea. So, so biomathematicians, what they do today is they assume that these mutations occur at a uniform rate. So this is a mathematical concept that I'm bringing in over here. So when you say that certain, certain uh, uh, mutations can occur with certain regularity, there's an assumption that they do that these happen at certain rate. And right. that allows them to work backwards with these assumed mark, uh, parameters. And they figure out when would these markers have branched off. So whenever you find a haplogroup that was uh, branching off over here and something else, some other population getting something else, how they get that information is by uh, artifices like this, by assumptions and working backwards and trying to make sense out of all of these things. Okay. So that said, let me quickly show you my next slide about the genetic markers. So uh, typically, uh, 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 when you take a chap off the road, let us say, and uh, get a saliva swab or blood sample and get his DNA record, it's not going to make much sense. It's not going to make much sense mm. other than the fact that, yeah, he's carrying this marker, this marker, this marker, maybe hundreds of markers. He's carrying that. So, sorry, How is that Dr. Going to Vedum, could you just explain what a genetic marker is again, just for me? Okay. So a genetic marker is some clustering of some hereditary characteristic, let us say. Okay. Some, genetic, some genetic clustering that is uh, that can be identified in a population, okay. which might have arisen because of these mutations that I talked about. Right. So that is something that is present in some descendants in a certain lineage and maybe not present in some other lineage. Okay. So the question then will be, how are this lineage and that lineage related, given right. that this fellow is carrying these markers and that fellow is that carrying those markers, how far back in time can I go so that they have a common ancestor? Right. Right. See, these Makes are the sense. kind of questions geneticists try to answer. So they give these uh, uh, very, very cryptic marker names like A, M, B, T. You'll see a whole lot of uh, numbers and letters over here. Right. However, like I said, if you take an average chap off the road and take his DNA content as markers, it doesn't make much sense. But if you go to a locality, let us say you go to um, some village in Tamil Nadu. Go to a village in Tamil Nadu and there are 10,000 people living there. You take 1,000 of them and take the saliva swab and then you go to the lab and you figure out what are the markers these guys have and you make a frequency distribution. Hmm. The frequency distribution will give you a pie chart like this. Hmm. It will tell you that maybe 33% of the people from this Tamil Nadu village carry this marker and about 25% uh, uh, of them carry some other marker, then uh, some trace amounts of several other markers. So now, instead of talking about a single individual, you're not talking about a population as a whole. You're saying that in this village in Tamil Nadu, it turns out that 33% of them are carrying this particular marker. Right. So now you have something quantifiable. Right. So this is a way uh, how genetic content of individuals can, can be aggregated. And you can now start talking about the markers that a population carries statistically. Right. So that gives rise to these pictures that I'm showing over here. For example, the A marker, that is present in North and South America in great detail and in uh, Central Asia, Siberia and other places, but not in Africa or India. Mm. The B marker only in Africa, but not in the rest of the world. Mm. The M marker, very important for us, that's present all over India, Asia, Northern Africa, Australia, North and South America, the T marker. So just by looking at these uh, pictures and color coded maps like this, it starts telling us stories. So. Given all of this background, one of the first papers that came out was way back in 1987, that is on mitochondrial DNA and human evolution, where these researchers, uh, Rebecca Kahn and Mark Stone King and uh, Alan Wilson, this is a paper that was reported in Nature in January 1987, and they talked about mitochondrial DNA from 147 people drawn from five geographical populations, 
they were analyzed and they said uh, they lived about 200,000 years ago. The ancestor of all wow. of these stem from one woman who lived in Africa 200,000 years ago. Wow. Today we sit with the luxury of uh, the present times, which is 2019, and say just 147 samples. Yeah. Why did they do that? Well, it pays to remember that was very expensive those days. Yeah. The computers were not powerful. Plus, it was very, very expensive to get samples and to analyze the DNA content and try to do this kind of research. That's why only few labs could do this kind of work. So this is pioneering work. So once they started this work, soon uh, there was a classic book by Luca Cavalli Sforza, which is in 94, where he said the name of this book is The History and Geography of Human Genes. Mm. And he said to study human evolution, and to study the population history, we need to study the differences between the genomes of different people in the world. And these differences will help us to infer who are more closely related and who are less closely related. So right. this was, this was uh, uh, his uh, central idea. Did he, base his, like, did he base his study on mitochondrial DNA as well? Initially, yes, because that was that was one of the most stable results that had uh, come out at that early point of time. And you must remember that when you start talking about ancient samples, there was not very good techniques to get genome-wide data and all of those kind of things. They could only try to get narrow specimens of uh, 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 fragments of uh, data. So going on, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, people started uh, developing uh, graphs of this nature, the frequency graphs that I talked to you, by making use the Y haplogroup. Y haplogroup means the male lineage. Mm. So they identified all these markers, the A, B, C, D, and all of these things. And for us, bottom line here, we have R1A and R1B. These are the important things for Indians to talk so to discuss. So why of. did the move happen from studying mitochondrial DNA, which is the mother's lineage, to Y haplogroups, which is you know male lineage? I'll talk about that. Okay. Both of them happened. Both of them happened okay. in this time frame from uh, late 1900s, uh, 1990 to uh, early 2000s. Uh, both Y, y and uh, mitochondrial DNA research, both of them happened. Okay. And, and But what I want to point out by looking at this graph is just by looking at the color, you see there's a story being told. Yeah. Most dramatically in this purple color, this purple color is the Q, the QY haplogroup, which you see it starts off in Siberia, somewhere in Siberia. And it starts pronouncing itself more and more in almost 100% of North and South America. Wow. So just by looking at a color now, you can now start saying some stories. It right. looks like these people came from this part of the world and uh, moved on over here. Whereas even the reverse could have been true. I mean, this, this map, maybe the people who came from here went this way and mixed with the people here. Right. So this is also one of those big battlefronts in genetics and linguistics. Right. Is the source of greatest diversity, the, is the point of greatest diversity a source or is it a sink? If you look at this as a diversity, is this the source or is it a sink where everybody's coming and mixing here? Interesting. Some, in some cases, you can make some calls, but in some cases, it's not easy to make the call. One size does not fit all. Right, that right. is the one. So this is the story from the y haplogroups. Similarly, if you look at the maternal mitochondrial DNA, you have a similar story showing up over here also, where here we are interested in the M marker, uh, present a lot in India and going out to the rest of the world. So early research aimed at trying to get these kind of understandings of the differences in genomes between various peoples of the world. And by looking at these differences, we could start saying at least in a static map, not talking about dynamics, me meaning movement and things like that, just in a static map, these are the differences between the peoples of the world. Right. At least that can be addressed by these groups. So having said that, people found that there are uh, 14 major Y haplogroups present today, the C, E, F, G, H, I, J, uh, K, L, O, P, Q, R, and T. And over in this slide, I'm also showing the estimated uh, time in the past when these mutations appeared in the record. For right. example, M130 associated with C appeared 50,000 years ago. So it just gives you an idea about yeah. uh, some of some of these things over here. So today, 90% of the Indians belong to seven haplogroups, and 77% of the Indians have the four largest haplogroups, the R, H, L, and J. I put the percentages here. It right. shows the R is about 38% of Indians have this R, 16% have the H, 11% have the L and 11% have J. Right. 
the age is based on this assumed rate of change that I talked about. You go back in the past and try to uh, estimate, and you get ages like 27,000 years ago, the R haplogroup came into the picture. 30,000 years ago, the H haplogroup came to mm. the picture. And for origin, I have a question mark because this is a disputable. Right. Here's where people start saying, where did these haplogroups even appear in the record? So some people say the R haplogroup happened in North Asia, which more or less ties in with the Aryan invasion right. theory, except the time frame is too ancient, 27,000 years ago, right. and so on. So similarly, you also have the maternal. Because the general assertion with the proponents, you know, we'll obviously be getting into it in greater detail in a little bit, but the general assertion from people, isn't it, that, oh, this haplogroup just originated around 4,000 years ago. And uh, then uh, came four, down the 1400 to, BCE, 1400 yeah, BCE. 1400 BCE, so, then came down yes. to India around 1500 BCE, and that's right. it. But the but when you look at uh, evidence where our, the R uh, haplogroup is originating, you know, over 27,000 years ago, it throws a lot of doubt over those assumptions. Precisely, precisely. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. But at this yeah. very high level, I only wanted to talk about the uh, Y chromosomal and similarly the M and N haplogroups, a whole host of them. And this one shows you the effective population size. It's in, uh, you can see the population scale here and the years before present over here. It shows you when these various markers appeared on the scene. Great diversity is present today. So uh, with, with, with uh, these slides, what I've done, Sham, is I've shown how we can move from an understanding of what are chromosomes and genes onto an understanding of what are markers, onto an understanding the differences between the genomes of different people and getting these nice color-coded maps onto an understanding of what are the uh, maternal haplogroups and the uh, uh, and the Y chromosomal haplogroups. We have understood this at a very high level. Right. From this, I can now take to the question of um, what does the maternal mitochondrial DNA tell about our ancestry? Right. So can we go to that question? Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, let, let's discuss what maternal mitochondrial DNA tells us about our ancestry. Then we'll move to the Y chromosome stuff as well. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. So, so I'll, I'll so, pull that up for you as well, those slides. Okay. All right, and we're here. Okay, so I'd like to focus on these excellent uh, 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 graphics produced by Stephen Oppenheimer in the real Eve in his uh, Journey of Mankind film. So in his works where he's rounded up all the maternal mitochondrial DNA until 2003, shows that the origin of the modern human is around 150,000 years ago. And from 150,000 years ago, at some point in Africa, we can start a story approximately 85,000 years ago when a group of individuals left Africa and walked this coastline. Generation by generation, they walked this coastline and reached all the way up to perhaps Taiwan in around 10,000 years. So this is one of the uh, this this is this is this is a migration that took place generation by generation, and obviously questions arise: Why did they not go into Europe, or did any branch actually go into Europe? Was there one out of Africa crossing? Were there two out of Africa crossings? A lot of uh, debate is there in literature. Not going to go into any great detail on any of them. Right. Then what we understand is around 75,000 years ago, there was a super volcano in Sumatra that erupted and caused a six-year nuclear winter and instant thousand-year ice age with a dramatic population crash to less than 10,000 adults. Again, these are all statistical measures from the diversity of genetics. This is how we estimate how many could have been there and so on. So uh, uh, it's estimated that volcanic ash from the eruption covered India and Pakistan by about five meters, which is an enormous amount of ash to be covered mm -hmm. by. And that caused a nuclear winter. You can see that in northern hemispheres, uh, ice ages had descended and uh, it caused an extinction literally of humans in India. And this picture here shows an uh, excavation in Jwalapuram where uh, Ravi Kori Sitter, the archeologist, the, he found that in Jwalapuram, you can still find the ash layer today Below the ash layer, you find artifacts of uh, ancient humans who lived there. Oh wow! And 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 then you have the ash layer, and above the artifact also uh, above the ash layer also you find human artifacts. So the story is perhaps that humans lived before the Mount Toba event, and then the Mount Toba event, and, and then Mount a repopulation. Toba, the of Mount Toba event was when? 
This is about 75,000 years ago. 75,000 years ago. Okay. So, so this has caused great angst in some people too, who said that modern human only came to India around 50,000 years ago or 40,000 years ago, because they need to tie it up with some of the genetics uh, material that they're seeing. And we'll talk right. about that a little later. Uh, but then the archaeology is telling us something over here. Here's an instance where you can actually validate what this narrator is saying in maternal mitochondrial DNA along with archaeology. And this one seems to be showing this. Right. So around uh, 65, 75 to 65,000 years ago, a repopulation took place on both sides. Uh, India was repopulated. And around 65,000 years ago, the ice ages had ended in Europe which also coincided with the dying out of one more species of human called Neanderthals. And the oh, human wow. Homo sapien was trying to avoid the Neanderthals till that time. Right. But once they became extinct, there was a vacuum in Europe. And that vacuum was filled with humans living this part of the world, which is approximately where today's Sindh and uh, Gujarat is. So is that living where that the Neanderthal area. population was primarily based around uh, the European area? Exactly. It is known today that the Neanderthal domain was up to Iran. Oh, wow. Okay. Northern Europe up to Iran was a domain of the Neanderthals. Which also makes sense when you, with the theory that people, you know, when they moved, started moving out of Africa, they were, they, they kept very close to the coasts. And Precisely. they did not try and venture too much inland. Precisely, because they did not want to confront these Neanderthals who are much bigger. And right. today we know by looking at the paleontology, the bones and other such things, that these were fierce people who lived a very warlike existence and perhaps even cannibalism and other such things. So the Homo sapien in that era of time, hunter-gatherer, forager and those kinds of things, would probably have been rather puny. Right. And he would not have wanted to confront the Neanderthals. Right. So it makes great sense why they'd have hid along the coast and avoided confrontation with the Neanderthals. And uh, there are some archaeological artifacts that Stephen Oppenheimer calls out. He says that there are in the, in the sh uh, shore areas where they know that ancient humans had rested, there are remnants of shellfish, shellfish that shells and other such things. If you take it, you know that humans had lived here based on the kind of deposits they left behind. Mm. And that can be architecturally, uh, sorry, archaeologically dated to an ancient period of time. Wow. That's, so that's uh, that incredible. said, that said, uh, in 65,000 years ago, humans left this part of the world, which is approximately Gujarat and Sindh, right. and went and became the future um, Europeans. They crossed right. the Bosphorus and became the Europeans. Right. And then about 45,000 years ago, maternal mitochondrial DNA tells us that groups of people from approximately this part of the world from uh, from which is around Sia, Sumeria and other places right. and from approximately Sindh and from eastern part of India along with Taiwan, they grouped in Siberia, approximately Siberia. And uh, uh, this slide shows around 40,000 years ago, these groups crossed the then land bridge and became the future North and South Americans. Right. So, this is a fascinating story of how modern humans peopled the entire world wow. based on maternal mitochondrial DNA. Okay. Very, very stable story is being said here. And what is remarkable is when the uh, uh, National Genogra uh, Genographic Consortium, when right. they came to India to collect their samples, somewhere near Madurai, they found the samples from this gentleman, Virumandi Antithevar. He actually carried the M130 marker, which is one of the ancient haplogroup C, YDN, YDNA, uh, it defines the first migrants to Australia and Southeast Asia That's from the incredible. Wow. 60,000 years ago. So here is a living descendant yeah. of one of those first people who crossed into India at an exceedingly ancient period of time. Fascinating. That's incredible. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, this is, so this, this is what the maternal mitochondrial DNA is telling us right. about how people were people. Again, if I will hark back to why this is important, the maternal mitochondrial DNA is only uh, impacted on the maternal lineage. Right. It is not contaminated by the male mitochondria because that's not part of the fertilization process over here. Right. And because of that, and both males and females carry the in their cells the maternal mitochondria, which means you can trace it back reliably to a very ancient period of time. Right. And that's telling us a very stable story for an ancient period of time. 
Right. Yeah, it's incredible. So we're, we're getting this story from the mitochondrial DNA study, you know, of, of the movement out of Africa, as shown by uh, Stephen Oppenheimer, the movement out of Africa, how human beings traveled. And you get a pretty clear picture of how the earth was populated uh, right. w- with the first migration of people from uh, outside of Africa. So this paints a very clear picture, A, and B, at the same time, it really throws the, you know, the whole question of, oh, these Aryans, these people originated in Ukraine one day, you know, so many 4,000 years ago, and then just walked out to India and so and so. So throws that entire theory in doubt. And I am assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm assuming that that is what led to the study of then, you know, why chromosomal markers. Is that correct? Precisely, precisely. You, you hit it on the head. So you cannot, let me share my slides over here. Sure. We cannot talk about Aryan invasion theory, which is a much more recent thing about um, um, 3,500 years ago, so-called 3,500 years ago, using ancient markers. These markers are too ancient. You want resolution in the time frame of interest. The time frame of interest is around 4,000 to 3,500 years ago. So it turns out that they said, all right, because the maternal mitochondrial DNA does not give us that resolution, can we get some data from the Y chromosome, which mm. is only inherited by the male lineage? Mm. Can we talk anything about that? Mm. So, interest focused on that. So, just before we just before we start with that, Dr. Vedam, do they offer any reason as to why you know the story of the mitochondrial DNA, you know, why they don't accept the story of the mitochondrial DNA? Do do they offer any reason for that? Well, well, the question is, what is the resolution that is present in the time frame under interest? Now, the maternal mitochondrial DNA has been great at explaining a macro story. Macro okay. story meaning that deep history. Deep history means 150,000 years ago, okay. 100,000 years ago. It has been super effective at uh, telling a deep story like that. Okay. Now, people are, want to get, take a lens and go to a closer time frame. The time frame on the interest is around, uh, like I said, 3,500 right. years ago. That resolution they cannot get from the maternal mitochondrial DNA. Okay. So, because they can't find it there, they're saying, all right, can we take a look at the Y chromosome? Okay. And it's the Y chromosome telling us something different. Okay. So it turns out that there are some markers in the Y chromosome which have been fortuitously helpful in keeping alive this question of Aryan invasion theory. That's right. The markers that they couldn't find in the, the maternal mitochondrial DNA, despite if I if I may go back a few slides, I hope you're sharing it. Yes. So I am uh, going back a few slides over here and showing this. This is the M and N haplogroups. This is 30,000 years before present, 20,000 years before present, 10,000 years before present, and here we are at present times. Right. So you can find that here are some markers that we have in the current times. It's fairly stable. These things go back to an ancient period of time, 7,000, mm. 8,000 years, and so on. So people are not used this because it doesn't assess that story very much. Mm. So we want to tell, instead of using the uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA, can the Y chromosome give us more resolution? So right. let me move back to the slide I wanted to show. Uh, so what is the story of the Y chromosome? So Peter Underhill was one of the first persons, not, not the first, a person, an important researcher, who in 2014 came out and said that having analyzed around 16,000 DNA samples from 126 populations hmm. across Europe and Asia, he came to the conclusion that the R1A, R1A, if you remember, is the uh, Y uh, chromosome haplogroup that is of interest for us over here. He said that split around 25,000 years ago and entered the genetic record. If you look at this map that I'm sharing, Hmm. the R1A is in purple and the R1B is in red. It turns out that this R1A, the purples are present mostly over here and the reds are mostly in Europe whereas the uh, purples are in Central Asia and India, and more so in Northern India and less in Southern India. Right. So these are all the uh, uh, stories that people queued in and uh, jumped on to try and explain what's going on. So once again, you cannot use a marker from 25,000 years ago to resolve a story of Hardians who are just around 4,000 years old. Right. So they also looked at these subclades, meaning that even finer uh, uh, clusterings, called Z282 and Z93. 
So these appeared in the genetic record around 6,000 years ago and right. provided an aha moment for people saying, let's study the Z93. Mm. And if we can show that Z93 came in Central Asia and is present in India today, conclusively it talks to us about uh, some RNA invasion. Right. So this is the uh, uh, this is a um, uh, summary of several researchers on the origin of R1A. So the R1A, several researchers like Bashu, Kevisild, uh, Cordio, Sengupta, and others from 2003 up to 2010 with Thangaraj, they have tried to say where did R1A originate. Some people say Central Asia. Central Asia would assess the Aryan invasion theory. Some people say Southern Asia, North India, Southern Asia, South Asia, Northwestern India, South Asia, South Asia. So the consensus seems to be most of the people say even the R1A appears to have originated in India wow. and not in Central Asia. So bottom line is both the empty DNA and the Y chromosome are indicating an Indic origin and they fail to validate the linguistic model. I think that is the summary from uh, what, what these markers are telling us. That's very interesting because there was a question just here right now from uh, Indian Singh. He was asking, where does the R start from? And uh, we just showed in the slides that you were sharing as well, Dr. Vedam, that there's a wide consensus among the scientific community as well that the, uh, the R1 uh, is, is originating more or less in India as well. So even Precisely. from the mitochondrial aspect you know mitochondrial study you can see that old antiquity of indian origin from uh, the study of y chromosome and the study of the r1a you can also see there's a wide consensus that the uh, you know that uh, chromosome originated in india precisely so in from both from both sides they're kind of you know you you find them kind of cornered uh, with with nowhere to go but for some reason it still keeps coming they still keep making the same argument right. they still keep coming out and saying you know um, that the r invasion theory is a real thing these guys marched into india around 1500 bc and immediately you know created a fully thriving civilization uh, immediately right. wrote incredible works of art and philosophy and uh, you know these illiterate <laughs> and displaced horses, population uh, displaced an incredible amount of population and you know relegated to them southern parts them to the southern part of india so you know we're going to get into some of the you know the current stars of the in the proponents of r and invasion theory in a second but why do you think despite such overwhelming evidence from both you know the maternal side and the parent you know the paternal side of the data what under what grounds are they still pushing this theory so I guess, I guess um, philosophically, we can look at, we humans are curious. We want to continue to address problems. None of us will stop and say that these problems are solved, I'm no longer going there. There is merit even for an electrical engineer to study Ohm's law, which is one of the most fundamental laws in electrical engineering. We will not say it's a settled thing. Maybe mm -hmm. there are some counterexamples. There is a story to tell over there. So the process of discovery continues. Our inquisitive minds go into studying things. So here we are with uh, several researchers, like I told you, if my slide is being seen right now. I'll, the I'll Arvan, pull it up again. I'll pull it up again. Just, the just Arvan A, some researchers said is in Central Asia. Some researchers said is in Southern Asia. So clearly there's a difference of opinion between different researchers. Mm. And in the rest of the talk, we'll try to understand why some of these differences might have arisen and show you that there's a methodology issue over here. Right. There's a tendency in the press and in people who don't, uh, who are not very familiar with the scientific process to conflate every single data point as if this is the final word. Hmm. That is a very fallacious view of how science proceeds. Right. It is an implicit understanding of, you know, pushing scientists to the role of demigods, right. demigods that these are from Harvard or these are from uh, MIT and places like this. So, so what they say is the indisputable they say is the gospel, basically. <laughs> yes, it's, I, I would hesitate to use that uh, metaphor, but anyway, <laughs> I, I, I would say that, uh, I would say that um, uh, there is a tendency to, to privilege some of these scientists that whatever they're saying is the ultimate word in common people because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So Shabda Pramana, right? Mm -hmm. So they go and say, this scientist who knows much more than me has said this, therefore I'm saying that is true. Right. However, scientists who understand the issues 
don't make claims like that. We sit back and understand all the issues that have gone into any kind of research. At the field, at the field work level, there are issues. At the lab level work, there are issues. At the mathematical analysis level, there are issues. At the level of interpreting results, there are issues. And we need to understand and examine them, deconstruct these methodologies. Only then you'll have a clear understanding of, can I take this claim for what is being said? Right. Or is there more to this? It's a long answer to what you said, why people are continuing to work on these things. Right. This is the reason, because no one person has got the final word, and we know it. So tomorrow there'll be new scientists again trying to address some of these old questions. There's, you know, the, the, there's questions that always come up every time this topic comes up as well. And uh, they say, well, if, you know, there's the origination, if these things originated in India, then why is there such a big genetic difference between North Indians and South Indians? Is, the, is there even such a difference between North Indians and South Indians? And there's another assertion that is often made by uh, some of the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory. They say that R1A, and this is being asked by John Rees in the chat right now as well, and uh, some other people have also asked that, that there is an assertion that only upper castes in India have the R1A. So is that true? Are both of those assertions true? <laughs> so these assertions are ridiculous because you have to now deconstruct what do you mean by caste? Right. And is caste such a rigid endogamous unit? I'm sorry, the camera might have oh, moved. Right. Is this framed well now? Yes. Okay. So they, they, they could, uh, when, you, when you claim that certain things are endogamous to a very ancient period of time where they have uh, uh, differentiated into certain characteristics, you are essentially claiming that there is a Brahmin gene mm. and you're essentially claiming there is a Kshatriya gene. I haven't seen evidence of any such thing. And if people were to come out with those papers, we'd like to deconstruct what methodology they use. Right. In fact, in the later part of our talk, I hope the reader who asked this question, the viewer, will understand some of the methodology issues that go into making these assertions. Right. So no, I do not believe there are caste-based genes. There is no such. In fact, every research seems to show that Indians today are a heterogeneous mix of a lot of genetic markers mm. and to figure out these things are difficult. Now the issue of, 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 um, of, of physical appearance, physical appearance, a question about skin color for example, most people talk about North Indians and South Indians look dark over here, light over there, that means two races. <laughs> Even this whole issue of race has got to be deconstructed. Race is an emotive word that scientifically is meaningless. Right. It's utterly meaningless. If I make a claim that 99.99% of us carry the exactly the same genetic right. content, right. what rubbish is race yeah. at the genetic level? At the end of the day, you're essentially talking about how human beings have adapted to various climactic conditions. Precisely, yeah. precisely. If, if it turns out that at least today, the genetic scientists are telling us that there is an allele called um, uh, SLC24A5, if I'm not mistaken. That is the one that is responsible for controlling the 15th chromosome of the human body. Mm. It is the one that is responsible for controlling the expression of melanin. And melanin will control what's the skin color you'll take on, depending on the latitudes that you live in, mm. as a response to vitamin D production and sunlight and all of those kinds of things. That particular mutation appeared in the record approximately 28 to 30,000 years ago. Mm. If you go over the maternal mitochondrial DNA research, that means it was right at the point when migrations are happening from India into Europe. Today we know this allele SLC24A5 uh, A is carried mostly by Europeans, some North Indians and some South Indians. Mm. So based on the presence of this marker or absence of this particular marker, which appeared 25,000, sorry, 30,000 years ago, right. you cannot make some ridiculous assertion of race <laughs> right. and come and say that it's the Aryans are fair skin in the king. Right. This, is a, this is an unscientific jump to a conclusion that cannot be deconstructed and it claims cannot be found at the genetic level. Yeah, so one has got to be careful. Take everything deconstructed. Is it Don't almost conflate like saying that because you know because these markers, you know, the markers that we're talking about right now, these markers emerged around thirty thousand years ago. Let's say uh, around about thirty thousand years ago. But the proponents of the Aryan invasion theory then turn around and say that oh, because the Aryans came around fifteen hundred BC, and then they set up these castes based on skin color. 
right? <laughs> so, and then you're saying, okay, in these fair-skinned people, you find these uh, markers. So, you're basically assuming that these people who came in came into India, you know, quote unquote, came into India around 1500 BC, they already had this idea about what their genetic markers were, and then they set up these casts based on what their genetic markers were. I mean, that's a pretty a uh, major assumption to make, which is not backed by any kind of evidence or True enough. True enough. So in other talks, I've shown how ideological standpoints made people to assert these kind of things. For right. example, the early linguistic researchers who were Christian ideologists, mm. who came in to proclaim the Christian idea of equality of humanity and look how lousy these uh, Hindus are mm. with this inequality. They wanted to try and uh, emphasize yeah. these things. So they created a certain narrative and these narratives found themselves into this, uh, exactly what you're saying, creation of endogamous caste units and all these kind of um, narrations. Right. So every claim has got to be deconstructed carefully Carefully. Neither dismiss it trivially, nor accept it trivially. Right. One has got to go deep into the issues and see what the issues are. Right. So there are some people who are asking questions in the chat about Tony Joseph. So I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's move on to some of the okay. you know the star proponents of the Aryan invasion theory currently. You know, one of them is Tony Joseph, uh, based in India. The other one that a lot of the proponents from outside of India like to quote. And a lot of the proponents within India like to piggyback on is David Reich. So, uh, you know, their work is the work that is being touted as the definitive evidence that proves the Aryan invasion theory. So could you discuss their work a little bit? Certainly, certainly. So I'm sharing my slides. Sure. So even before... I talk about this, like to talk about what I said earlier, the propensity of people to conflate the next data point as a next big thing. This is based on the false idea that as we move forward in time, we learn more and more that our, well, in general, that is true, but then not every advancement is a linear, I learn more, more, more and more. Hmm. Science goes in this kind of a zigzag kind of things. We go into dead ends, we go into wrong conclusions, somebody else comes with more data, falsifies your earlier work or supports your earlier work. This is how science proceeds. Hmm. One has got to be mindful of that. That said, I'm going to talk about genome-wide research. And like you said, uh, uh, Professor David, I tend to call it Reish, but probably I'm mispronouncing his oh, name. My apologies <laughs> for that. Uh, from Harvard University. Yeah. He wrote this uh, book recently, Who We Are and How We Got Here. It's a very nice, readable book, and I recommend people to read it, only to understand what is going on in current day uh, research on, uh, on, 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 on uh, genetics. Not that the claims are to be taken in total as a final word from mm. a superstar professor from Harvard University, but to understand. Everybody's got something to teach us, and Professor Reich has got outstanding things to teach us over here. So the failure to validate the Aryan invasion narrative based upon the maternal mitochondrial DNA and the uh, Y chromosomal research led people to ask, why are we only looking at the X in the Y chromosome? Wait a minute, we got 22 autosomes here. Right. Why don't we take the entire uh, chromosomal record and start talking about people? Sounds great in practice, in theory. Right. But in practice, the issue is, if I need to get ancient samples and the entire chromosome of the ancient samples, that is not an easy issue mm. because these skeletons have been buried under the mud and they've got mineralization deposits in the bones. The DNA has degraded. Bacteria has come in and contaminated them. Salt water has eroded them. All kinds of issues have happened, which means I cannot get uh, intact uh, 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 genome-wide chromosomes for me to do my analysis. So Professor Reish, in pages 30 to 33 here, he says, earlier they used 20 letter long fragments and they discarded everything that they're not interested in, but only the small fragments are interested in and duplicated these things enormously, the genotypes. Mm. And based upon that, they would do their research. It's only a lab process to make things work. However, in the newer methods, he says, with the advancement in computer technology that you can make uh, better, remember, before 2010, you didn't have very powerful computers. Hmm. Right now, we have multi-core computers that have 64 bit that can address a huge amount of addressable space. So you can do a lot more computation today than you could do in a 32-bit computer. Right. So today, they take brute force, larger samples, but he has got to deal with contamination and data. So what he says is, in order to construct a genome-wide um, uh, sample, 
they get a small fragment here, another fragment here, another fragment here from the ancient sample, for example, Harappa, if you will. And the fill in the blanks is done with mm. both modern day DNA, mm. human DNA, as well as chimpanzee DNA. Remember, we share 98% of the chromosomes yes. with chimpanzees. So you could actually fill in the blanks with chimpanzee DNA. And that's what they do. Right. And it describes that in uh, page 30 to 33. And this is what mm -hmm. they call the genome-wide data. Having said that, at a high level, pages 129 to 135, mm. David Reich says that Europeans are more closely related to the Indians and less to the Chinese. He also found the Chinese are more closely related to Indians than to Europeans. Mm. So based on this, we might, at least a naive person, might come in here and say, in my model, I'm going to take Indians as the common link between the Europeans and the Chinese and base my mathematical curve fitting and whatever else yeah. to such a However, David Reich did not do that. He did not do that because he wanted to validate the RNA invasion theory. Interesting. Which talked about a hypothesized proto-Indo-European speaker right. who lived in Central Asia and came at a certain point of time into India and was a common ancestor between Indians and Europeans. So he put a layer so of abstraction. He, how does he reconcile the mitochondrial study, the Y chromosome study, that all that shows, you know, the antiquity of the DNA within India? And, and he, how does he like shoehorn this hypothesized proto-Indo-European speaker at 4000 BC? Well, well, the issue is that he's blazing a new path, okay. a novel path in genome-wide research. Others had not done genome-wide research. Others had done X and Y. And he's saying, let's put that aside for now. Let's take a look at the genome-wide data. Okay. Does that tell us something? So it is acceptable in that kind of a, uh, thinking to say, all right, uh, we'll keep it aside. We'll bring it in later on to the argument. Keep okay. it aside for now. We'll go with what you're saying. Okay. You got 22 autosomes. What is your research telling us? But my issue is the model validity. If this is what he found in his data, why would he accept a model which is clearly uh, disputable? Uh, disputable that he put a layer of abstraction to the hypothesized proto-Indo-European speakers mm. between the Indians and the Europeans. So this is what he did. And Sorry, he, one, one more question really quickly, Dr. Vedam. What was his reason for putting in that that layer, the hypothesized pi speakers? What was his reason for this, that? This is this is one of my uh, not just mine. A whole lot of other researchers, Indic researchers, also the criticism that they levy against this work. Hmm. It is a circular logic. Okay. It is a circular logic where there is something that I want to prove, and the entity that I want to prove, I'm going to use as an assumption. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> It's, it's like saying, Sham, I want to prove that you're a human being. Right. So let me assume that you're a human. Yeah. So you, you get to the conclusion <laughs> first and then you modify or, you know, you mold the data to fit that conclusion. Precisely. It's, okay. it's in a sense, it's meaningless. In mathematics, we have this danger all the time that right. what is an assumption and what is a fact that you're using in your work? What is it that your, your hypothesis, what are you trying to prove? All these things are important. So the claims are important, the model is important, the methodology is important, and here the model validity is what we're calling out. So that mm -hmm. is one issue. So uh, let me not spend too much time on this slide. Right. I'll go to the next slide. So this in a picture shows you the current claims by the genome-wide research. If you can see my slide, it shows that this is the uh, Yamnaya people around uh, in Central Asia. So the claim is around 7000 BCE from Anatolia. Anatolia is Turkey. Remember Colin Renfro's uh, hypothesis about agriculture and spread of agriculture. So the theory is that these people came and they displaced the European populations and Europe became white as a consequence of these people going there and replacing the black-skinned people who lived there, right. who were the real native uh, Europeans, if you will. So this happened around 7000 BCE in this time frame. Around that same period of time, he postulates, this group postulates that pastoral Iranian, rather Iranian pastoralists, farmers, they moved into India and became the so-called ancestral South Indians wow. in this time frame, around 7000 BC. What's 9, interesting about this argument is that 
not even the south indians not even the so called dravidians are native to india apparently yes yes everybody is <laughs> everybody is an enemy according to this current claims right, these are the right. claims that have been made and then after 3000 bc you see the appearance is movement to these people then to china and other such places and from central asia coming into india around 1500 bce right. this is the so called ancestral north indian so this is how he's tied up the past research and the current research into uh, uh, a narrative based on what he calls a genome wide research now remember this is a claim this is a claim by a superstar professor right we have two options one is shabda pramana i don't know better i will accept what this professor says this is the final this is the truth i'm going right. to write off a book on this one and i'll write an entire book and say who we are how we got here all this kind of things right. and tony joseph and who else wants to write books right. i'm not criticizing this man i mean he doesn't know better he'll defer to a nobel prize winner or a expert in this Does case tony joseph has actually have Lynch. the same argument as well as david right once again Does Tony Joseph have essentially the same argument as David Wright? I as believe well? so. I believe so. at least my reading of his articles, popular articles in uh, various uh, magazines, leads me to believe that uh, his claims are based on the understanding of David Wright's claims. One of the things he says, I believe, also is that uh, there, there's a bunch of questions here about Tony Joseph. One of them is Tony Joseph misconstrues caste system and calls our ancestors that the Varna system is basically based according to geography. that's one of the claims of tony joseph that the varna system is essentially based around geography and the north indian the white north indians basic if you can call them that they decided the varna system and then they imposed it on the southern indians that's another these one of these are lovely stories these are lovely <laughs> stories by people who want to tie and uh, piggyback on some research that is right. happening in genetics and try to quickly go to ideological narratives right however like i said everything needs to be deconstructed and i'm sure if tony joseph is watching this he will understand i am doing him the courtesy of understanding that yes he's written a nice popular book with a good story right. however it's got to be deconstructed right. one cannot take these uh, uh, claims that face value value and say whoa this is the ultimate story of who we are if you make bombastic claims like that then you must be prepared to uh, understand the ignominy of being uh, decon- deconstructed over here mm. i guess i guess that is the downside of this so anyway this is the uh, claims and i'm going to deconstruct these things very very shortly uh, uh, I, i'm not going to read all of these things sure. but i just like to call out uh, associate of david rice that is patterson patterson is a mathematician so he proposed an indian composite model as a mix of andamanese oh wow <laughs> ancient iranian and ancient steppe right to fit to 150 groups this claim is made in this page 148 to 153 and this is a very disputable way of clustering hmm. why is that important i'm going to say if you give me the time a uh, little further down uh, uh, sham sure. we'll, we'll discuss all of these things So uh, I think I think with that I, I just made a roundup of right. what are the claims being made by the genome wide research. So far we started with an, an understanding of uh, genetics at the high school level. We looked at markers and how people use these markers, differences between markers, uh, major haplogroups. We talked about research in empty DNA, what it is telling about our ancestry. We talked about Y chromosome, what is it telling us about our ancestry. Then we moved into the latest research, which is genome-wide research, mm. and what are the claims being made? So from this, I would like to uh, take it to a deconstruction of some of their methods. Um, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, let's 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 get right into it. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to discuss methodology. I'm going right. to start the thought experiment and highlight some results that opens some questions on methodology. So the the process is I am an engineer, and as an engineer, I do a lot with mathematics, with models, with fitting, with optimization. I do this for a living. I've been doing this for more than 30 years. So I have a, a deep understanding of what it means to be a person who works with applied mathematics. So I'm going to deconstruct some of the methodology in light of my background. Like I said, genetics research, field data, get the saliva swabs, lab work, uh, trying to figure out the markers and reconstruction of genomes, uh, uh, genome-wide uh, data and such things. Third is bioinformatics, where you go and start saying, "This is the model I'm going to use. This is the algorithm I'm going to use," and run these things in your computer and uh, for days together maybe and get your results. Finally, interpretation. 
So I'm not going to interpret because I'm not an expert there in biology. I'm not going to talk about lab work because I'm not a biologist. I'm going to talk about the mathematics, the third component here, mm -hmm. and see what is going on. So what do people do in this work? We collect ancient samples. Today, in this nature paper, if you take a look at it, I think it's March 2018, we have something like uh, 1,300 genome sequences from ancient remains. And these are from uh, places like Europe, North America, South America, Oceania, Africa, and Asia. Most of these Asian samples came in once the, at least the Indian samples came in once they got access to CCMB data from Hyderabad. Right. So this is the, most of it, like you see, is in Europe and other places, but this is the samples. The methodology is you have ancient samples, you have present day samples. Now we need a narrator that connects the ancient samples or current samples. And I hope these slides will help to understand what is going on. Here's right. a thought experiment. In this thought experiment, what I'm saying is, you have some ancient population, you have present day population, you have samples of ancient population, you have uh, saliva swab of present day population, and in between what's connecting them is multi-generational recombination. In this thought experiment, let us assume that we know the exact ancient population. Let us say that in this village in Haryana, present day Haryana, 4,000 years ago, mm. there lived 10 individuals or 100 individuals. Let us further say, I know the DNA profile exactly, genome-wide data, no problem, I know it exactly. I know how many people live there. Let us assume that I know the exact descendants. I know who married whom, who gave birth to whom, and who married whom, how many generations, and so on. So I know the exact descendants, mm -hmm. I know the exact number of generations, I know the exact pairings in this pool. Then if these are the four colors that I've shown over here, today you have a very mixed up color. And the present day population, I know the exact descendants in this village. I know that those 10 guys who lived in Haryana uh, 4,000 years ago, only their descendants are living in this village. Nobody mm. from outside has come. Right. I know the direct descendants. I have their exact DNA profiles. Even in such a scenario, to work backwards from here to here is a computationally, uh, it is an exponential exercise. Hmm. People who work with computer science and NP hard problems will appreciate that you're setting up state space trees. Literally, these are upside down state space trees. You're going from, if I have a husband and wife today, this husband has got a mother and father, wife has got a, a mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, grandfather, hmm. grandmother. So you see the tree grows upwards. Yes. Tree grows up. At some point, it's a combination too. I mean, you cannot have an infinite population in the right. past. It goes in the, uh, it combines two. The point is, even working backwards over here and getting is an exponential exercise. That is the first uh, thought experiment I want to say. Second, I'll make it non-ideal. I'll say in this mix, everything remains true, except I don't know the exact pairings. I don't know who married whom over here. Okay. If I don't know who married whom, but I know everything else, then there's much higher complexity because I must traverse unknown pairings. In my mathematics, each time I must say, perhaps this person married this person, and this is the genetic combination. Perhaps this person married this person, this is a genetic combination. Hmm. So it's a complicated exercise in a non-ideal. Hmm. Now let me take it one step further and talk about the real non-ideal. I don't know the exact ancient population. I right. don't have the DNA profile. I don't know their numbers. Right. In the recombination, the how many generations, I don't even know the number of generations. Right. I don't know the exact descendants. I don't have the pairings in the pool. I have no idea whether this present day population is only their descendants. A whole lot of others could have come into the pool. I don't have that exact DNA profiles. All kinds of issues are there. How do you map this? Right. This is the issue facing bioinformatics people today. So what they do is they assume statistical models. Hmm. They assume some parameters. They do curve fitting. Hmm. And having done all of these things, they attempt to map what do I have here with what I have here with all these unknowns that I'm dealing with. Hmm. In order to do this, what do you need? You need a model. Yeah. You need a model. You need to have, even if you're going to loosen up the number of generations over here, you need to have at least what is upper bound and lower bound of the number of generations I'm going to allow. You need to know that. In your algorithm, to initialize your algorithm, you need to understand how do I initialize this, what are the parameters. 
in order to uh, make up for the fact that you don't know these pairings, you're now going to talk about assumed rate of change of certain mutation markers. Mm. So there are parameters that assumed, assumed coming in and you need to do the curve fitting. So all this done, I'm not going to explain this, but my slide shows you have something called an admixture problem. You know, attempting to relate the people in ancient population, current population. It's an optimization problem. Mm. You set up a mathematical criterion function like this, where you have some measurements of, uh, of, of present day population. You know some alleles in what frequency they appear in the present population, but you don't know from postulated ancestral population mm. with, uh, that you have, you don't know how many generations have taken place here, you don't know the contribution. So bottom line, I'm not going to bore you to death with sure. these things. The <laughs> bottom line is there are some unknowns in this thing. Yeah. But figuring out what those unknowns can tell you a story. Yeah. It can tell you precisely what is the percentage of genetic content from this ancient material in my current day sample. Right. In order to do that, they use something called the generational statistical model, a hidden Markov model. Right. And people who have understood the Markov models will understand there are some assumptions that go in over here and how you work the numbers and other such things. So the bottom line is in this log likelihood method, you want to try to minimize this criterion function by searching over these unknown parameters Q and uh, uh, G by trying to search for, uh, sorry, Q and F. Mm. I made an estimate of some of these numbers and set about 33,000 parameters. Right. Wow. And bottom, next, the next big thing, uh, I'm sorry, this is going into mathematics, but then it's important to understand the sham. If I come and tell you that you have a non-linear model versus a linear model, to a mathematician, it tells a lot of things. Right. A linear model that is a full ranked, something called a full ranked model, has got exactly one answer. If it is a non-linear model, I know there are multiple answers. Mm. I know there are multiple answers. Right. For example, over here, I'm saying if you have K ancestral populations, I have factorial K global minima that I can land up with. Mm. So the question is, which is the answer you're going to privilege? It's like to give a simple metaphor and analogy. If I want to go from JFK airport to the Statue of Liberty and I want to drive over there, I go to Google Maps and tell me, find me the direction from JFK rental car up to the uh, uh, ferry terminal, maybe the Statue of Liberty, you want mm -hmm. to do that. It's going to tell me, do you want toll road or do you want the shortest route or do you want to avoid highways? Eventually, it's going to give me a bunch of criteria to say you can go by this route, you can go mm -hmm. by this route, you can go by this route, you can go by this route. In other words, to map these two data points, I have multiple answers. Right. It's exactly the same over here in linguistic models or in genetic models. Mm. You have multiple answers. The question is, which answer are you going to privilege? True, true. And I'm claiming that the answer you privilege is a consequence of the model you've selected, the assumptions you've made, the initializations that you've done. All of these things is going to converge to an answer. So that said, what is going to happen in papers, I'll show you one demonstration of that later, that one person can take some ancient samples and present day populations, let's call it distribution A, mm. and you can get 100 generations are there for the most common recent ancestor between the present day samples and the ancient samples. Some other person can come and take the same ancient samples and have a different distribution of the present population and say, no, 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 150 generations. How do you account for this? Right, that's true. If, if genetics is such a precise science, I'm not uh, debunking genetics over here. I'm talking about the methodology, yeah. the meta-methodology. In addition to lab work, in addition to other things, you're using mathematics here. And mathematics, there are several mathematics you can use. I'm debunking, not debunking, but critiquing some of these things over here. One of the so, questions that I'm, uh, I continue to get, uh, and I, I wanted to just quickly uh, run that through you, if, if that's okay, because I was wondering about that too is people are asking that genome analysis from upper caste is showing the presence of R1A, but the same genome study does not find R1A in SCSTs. Is that a real thing or, uh, or how, do we, how do we explain that phenomenon? So, so people who make such claims are essentially saying the R1A is now an indicator of caste. Yes, that's what the, that's Are making what a that claim is. that's an indicator of caste. That has got to be studied in greater detail. That has got that claim that people who make these things, what I'm saying here will show you the fallacy of that kind of conclusion. Okay. The fact that you select a certain model, the fact that you select a certain population size in your data, 
the fact that you include certain populations in your distributions A and distributions B, the fact that you assume a different number of generations between the ancient samples to present samples will give you a boatload of different results. Right. This is just the admixture problem. There's one more uh, problem called PCA. So regarding the claim that it is only present in upper caste, not in SCSTs and so on and so forth, the question is, you're privileged R1A. What other markers are present that are common between the two? Hmm. We're not talked about that. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting point. We're not talking point. about that. Yeah, yeah. We're not. We only privileged R1A because it's a convenient crutch for some of the researchers here right. to talk about uh, uh, to try and uh, uh, add uh, strength to the so-called Aryan invasion theory. Right. That is what is going on. So there are questions. I'm not dismissing that question offhand. I'm only saying you need to deconstruct, go deep into understanding these things. You will not get answers because published papers have got a vested interest to push a certain kind of a narrative. Either so the basically the question is that others. we're only focused on R1A and we're not looking at other linkages that exist between the so-called upper caste and the SCSTs, the Precisely. other genetic linkages that are present. Precisely. Right, so okay. the presence of one difference is what is being conflated over here. I don't even know if that claim is true. I don't right. know if you take 100 so-called SCST people, you're not going to find any trace of the RNA marker. And if you do find that, what it means when such a recombination might have happened in their lineage, I don't know these things. So people who make these claims need to understand the statistical nature of uh, some of these things and right. how you cannot conflate it to, uh, uh, to something like this. Right, right. So, so, so that said, uh, Sean, very quickly, sure. the methodology there are two methods. I talked now about the admixture problem, where you have a model-based estimation and you have statistical model unknown parameters. You search the space of parameters to fit these things. And there are some programs today, structure, frappy, admixture that do these things. On the other hand, there's an algorithm-based estimation based on the data that you have, and they use multivariate analysis using clustering and principal component analysis. And they use things like Eigenstrat. I'll talk about both of these things. Right. Both these things inherit these problems. So what are the assumptions? Is the model appropriate? Is the problem scaled well? Is there a convergence issue, initialization, then deeper algorithmic issues like Hessian, quasi-Newton? Is there a global optimality? How many solutions? And my central point is just because convergence was obtained, it does not confer correctness. Right, yes. I could have gone from JFK to Statue of Liberty by any of these routes. It does not privilege anything more than my own preference for avoiding tolls. Let's say I don't have the money to pay the tolls to go through Manhattan or whatever. Mm. I don't know if you had to go through that, but bottom line is I don't have the money to pay the toll. <laughs> so it is convenient for me to avoid tolls. Only in that sense, it's a convenient narrative. So just because you got convergence, it does not confer correctness. That is the mantra to take away from some of these things. Mm. And uh, I, I, I don't know if there is time to talk about uh, some of the models or ad admixture. You have several models. Let me just give a very high level more idea. We said that David Reich put a level of abstraction between Indians, Europeans and Chinese by saying there's a proto-Indo-European uh, speaker in between them. That is a model. And here are some samples of models that people have used for admixture the continuous gene flow. This means there is population one, population two, and they give some percentage of their genetics to make a hybrid. Then going into future generations, only population two is allowed to mix with the hybrid and you make a, a, a continuous gene flow of this nature. You might have graduate uh, admixture, things like population one, population two, make a hybrid with some percentage of the genetics and both contribute to the hybrid mix in the future generations and you have a very mixed uh, hybrid over here. In the hybrid isolation model, population one, population two make the hybrid, but they don't give their genetics directly later on. It's only the hybrid in future generations. Right. Three models. An example of this, for example, can be North America. North America, where you had the black African population and the white European population over mm -hmm. here, they mix and make a hybrid. But because of the power dynamics, maybe in the past at least, mm -hmm. only the whites could mix with a hybrid. The blacks were not allowed, the fertility was controlled. So that could be one model of, uh, uh, of, right. of uh, right. continuous gene flow. I'm, I'm not saying it's appropriate for that. I'm sure, giving an sure, example. Sure, sure. Question is in India, what was the model used? Right. Was a model one of, let's say, a boatload of uh, Central Asians came into India over here, population one, 
and then uh, uh, they created a hybrid with the existing population and continued on. Is that the model or is there some other model that they came to an empty land and uh, did that? Many questions. That is the bottom line. What is right. the model they've used for right. admixture and what, how do they get that? Right. Here I wanted to show one, one more thing, um, um, uh, Sean. This shows a dramatic impact of sampling on the results. This is from a paper in Hereditary Genetics 2015, where the highlight that I want to make here is this man said, if I'm going to take your genetic sample to make my study, right. I require you to be living in your grandfather's location. Right. If you're living in the same place as your grandfather, there's some semblance of genetic stability as opposed to a migrant from some village in Tamil Nadu going to New Delhi and starting a new life over there. If you live in the same place, genetic stability. By using such kind of studies, he tried to analyze the Z93 branch, and he found that the most common recent ancestor is 15,000 years ago, plus minus 2,900 years for this sample. Wow. wow. Which is in sharp contrast to what David Reich is saying, right, right. that 3,500 years hmm. is the most uh, recent common ancestor between Indians and Central Asians. Right. So two results, two dramatically different results, uh, 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 conclusions. How is yeah. that possible? It's because of the impact of sampling. What is the data that you admitted? And the methodology too, right? Exactly. So it yeah. fits in with what I've just been trying yeah. to explain in yeah. my uh, uh, things. Oh, yeah, as uh, pro assumptions, what is the model you used? What is the data you use? What is the convergence? All these things have got a bearing. Now that said, I'd like to talk about a rebuttal from Dr. Premendra Priyadarshi and uh, Dr. Murli Vadivelu. So they analyzed one of the recent papers too that talked about uh, the so-called uh, um, migrants from the Central Asia. Yeah. And they used figure three of this paper and they said, all right, you're claiming that such a percentage of genes are present from Central Asia and the Northern Indian population. So let us work some numbers. Let us try to see how many Central Asians must have come into India to overwhelm the existing population genetically to see the numbers you're claiming today. Hmm. The picture is like this. Supposing I take a pure white Scandinavian, white, uh, white uh, European from Scandinavia and put him in a village in uh, Tamil Nadu, let us say 100 years ago. And then now 100 years later, I look at the descendants and try to see what trace of that uh, Europeans material can I find in the present day populations in the village. Yeah. The situation is akin to that. You're trying to see what is the population that must have come for you to have a genetic presence today. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Premendra Pridarshi and Muri, uh, Murli Vadibailu came and said, four times the population of uh, uh, that region in northern India right. must have come in from Central Asia wow. to over genetically to have the claimed numbers, percentage numbers that you are saying. Wow. Wow. Which means if you look at Saraswati Sindhu civilization as having had one million population, it is saying four million people came from Central Asia and 3,500 <laughs> years ago to right. overwhelm the population genetically. Right. How is that possible? There's no record genetically. Yeah. There's no record archaeologically. Right. No literary presence of migrations. Nothing. Right. Nothing. So it's like a privilege. Four million people, certain numbers four million and people numbers. came to a came, you know, left, migrated from one part of the world to another part of the world. There's a great level of remembrance of it. Like even if you're talking about like the way you know, it, it's it's such a major part of Irish history, the Irish migration from Ireland to America during the after the potato famine. It's such a huge part of Ireland's history that Precisely. every single Irish American alive today remembers the event when their ancestors left Ireland in massive numbers and migrated to the United States. But Precisely. for some reason, these four million plus people who came down to India from, you know, Ukraine or something have no memory of it. Neither the people in India nor the people in Central Asia no have got anything in their literary or oral records that would suggest that a large-scale migration of people. That right. is the bottom line. Yeah. And these numbers are very questionable. It's a mathematical exercise, a nice mathematical exercise with no bearing to reality. Finally, just want to talk about this PCA. PCA is the other side of analysis that people do. Basically, what they do is they go to um, several regions. Let's say from Central Asia, you select about 10 regions between that to India, and you have some markers that you're interested in, genetic markers, and you find how many people in, in region one have this marker, you plonk it down in your matrix, 
how many in region 2 have this marker how many in region 3 have this marker maybe region 4 region 5 don't have that marker region 6 has that marker similarly for other markers you populate a matrix of this kind and if you were to go to your mathematical software and ask to do something called a singular value decomposition of this matrix, right. it's going to give you something called principal components or the singular values. So the methodology that people are using, like David Reich and others, is they, they take the two largest principal components, put it on the X and Y axis, the P1 and the P2, and they try to map these data point numbers and try to show you this region two, region five, region one. It shows you which are the maximum contributors to this principal component analysis. Mm. In other words, it's trying to uh, say out of all the data that you have, which is more relevant to my analysis. And it gives you this nice gradation over here, which he calls a gradient. Mm. And this gradient, because the region wise, the geography also here, mind you, and that geography now tells a story right. of migration. Right. This is what they do. Right. However, I now want to call attention to Patterson and Reed's work on including the Andamanis. Mm. Andamanis were included in the PCA analysis to artificially create a genetic distance, sufficient uh, polarity, if you will, mm. so that these numbers will be spread out to assist that narrative of ancestral South Indian being different from ancestral North Indian. Right. This is what they did. Andamanis separated out 60,000 years ago. They mm. kill anybody who goes there. Right. They don't mix with mainland Indians. Right. <laughs> there is no genetic content between Andamanese and Indians. Zero, zero. They've been isolated. Right. Why would you include them in today's profile of Indians to tell a story of ancestral South Indians? So here is a case where you're working the numbers. You're working the numbers so that it tells you the story that you want to say. Right. It again goes back to my same uh, narrative that everything depends on what is the assumption that you have, what is the uh, yeah. uh, model that you have selected, what and is what the is methodology? the methodology, appropriateness yeah. of that, whether you're doing admixture right. or whether you're doing PCA, every paper that you take, you can deconstruct it and ask these relevant questions. Now, the question is, is everybody in this game ideological or mm. what is going on? This last slide that I have will uh, give an idea, Sean. This is a paper that came in 2015 in language. It was an attempt to fuse linguistics and genetics. And I'm calling out the circular nature of the logic over here from Berkeley. So what did they do? They took a dictionary of 200 words and they have some what they called ancestry constraints from uh, uh, based on clade constraints, the black mm. mark, bars mm. and time constraints, red mars, bars. What are these bars? These are the linguistic model. This one over here is Hittites, approximately, I think, 1800 BCE. And they put Vedic Sanskrit just little less than that, mm. because that's a narrative, right? Uh, right. Hittite Sanskrit came from Syria into India. Right. That is a linguistic narrative. So they put Sanskrit over here. This is also a constraint. Right. Then they put the other things, these red constraints that you see are the various time constraints they have appearing Latin is over here, right. out of the linguistic model. These black bars are the uh, uh, constraints on the genetic markers. Mm. Genetic markers give them these constraints. So now they try to go about a mathematical exercise of trying to say, can I fit this model mm -hmm. and try to see, is there a mapping between linguistics and genetics? And guess what? It's a mathematical exercise. Right. It is going to do that because those are the constraints you set up. You set up a constraint to converge to a model like this, and then you say, aha, I have now found that uh, I have a validation of linguistics and genetics model, beautifully agreeing problem is your your assumptions the thing that you want to prove became part of what your analysis included right it's a circular logic right, and a right. lot of things like david reese's work he's trying to prove the aryan invasion or the aryan migration so he assumes a certain number of generations right. he assumes a certain number population mix andamanese ancestral north indian south indian it is relevant because you need to get your data to fit and converge right the mantra, I'll close with that in my presentation, is that just because you got convergence in your mathematical model does not confer any correctness. Right. So your claims have to be tempered down. Your claims have to be tempered down sufficiently, saying that if I did this analysis with these assumptions and constraints, this is the convergence and this is the narrative I have. Right. If I do sensitivity analysis, if I take this data out, 
the andamanis for example right. <laughs> if i take that out guess what my numbers will not align i will not get convergence to this anymore yeah if you assume a different number of generations you'll get a different kind of convergence yeah. so i'll end over there sham saying mm-hmm. that the results that we have today from david rees group other groups and uh, mm-hmm. narratives from tony joseph and others had to be deconstructed carefully by the discerning reader mm-hmm. the person who's ideologically wants to grab some data points yeah sure go do that and be happy yeah. but if you want to uh, be discerning you need to deconstruct these things yeah. deconstruct it at the mathematical level at the laboratory level yeah. at the data level at the history level archaeology level hydrology level astronomy level and say wait a minute yeah. we have a big problem here exactly right and that's <laughs> that's the question here you know you can even make the point that okay at some point certain people came into india and there was this mixture of people from northern india and the scythians and the greeks and the iranians and there was that you know that there was that mixture maybe happened between people but the question is you're saying that these people brought this fully developed culture and civilization right. with right. them into right. india and replaced its native civilization right. which there is absolutely no proof for precisely you know, precisely so so those are fact, strong claims right those are very strong very very claims. strong in claims in fact there is no way you know there's absolutely no proof that the vedic culture of india is not uh, in native to india you precisely. know people may precisely. have come and gone but the culture yes. originated in india and not only did it not not only did it originate in india but in fact people then left india and took that culture and that language and you know th- those linguistics with them to settle yes. other parts of the world i mean that's how that's where the linguistic direction is not the other way around precisely so anybody who wants to make a claim that they are the final word in aryan invasion theory and other such things has got to be intellectually honest to mm. admit this other data points on astronomy archaeology hydrology literary linguistic and everything if you don't do that if you brush it aside as inconvenient data points if you brush it aside as uh, not reliable you are not done the diligence yep. you are not done the diligence you are not an honest broker anymore you are ideological or a shallow researcher yep. yep. you're coming in with a shallow narrator yep. that's the bottom line yep. and if i may uh, just show a couple of more slides Absolutely. sham uh, sure if you if you can share my screen yep like to call out some critiques that are coming in in present times new york times in uh, january of this year brought out an expose on um, uh, uh, a very detailed one if you will that impacts the research being done at harvard and it provocatively asked a question is ancient dna research revealing new truths or falling into old traps says genetic geneticists have been using old bones to make sweeping claims about the distant past but the revisions to the human story are making some of the scholars of prehistory uneasy and that's an understatement right this this uh, expose says serious challenges to the soundness were laid out during nature's peer review process and in a highly unusual move the paper was accepted over steep fast opposition from two of the three original peer reviewers on its anonymous panel confidential documents made available to me reveal deep concerns in the paper's methods and its conclusions i am a peer reviewer for engineering journals and i know that when an editor asks me to review he's also asked two or three others he's not relying only on my word and i deconstruct the paper to the best of my knowledge to understand what the issues are the editor looks at what others are saying and he makes an uh, uh, a conclusion on what has to be done is the paper accepted should the paper come with revisions or should we reject the paper he's got an option to do those things so what happened is uh, uh, they said that the object reviewers were overturned bottom line is that uh, they were overturned on the basis of uh, a lot of data i'm not going to read all of these sure, things sure, sure. they went ahead with david rees efforts in other words the question of the peer review process in nature trying to privilege pedigree over the issues raised by the reviewers the pedigree in this case harvard university so it is it's very possible editors are human they come in and say that all right i sent the review out to uh, these two universities which are lower in uh, ranking than harvard so am i going to take their word over harvard again the <laughs> shabda pramana business yeah. <laughs> 
privileged the uh, Harvard University professor, and that's what has happened over here. Right. So I'm not calling this out as uh, to diss this professor or the research. I'm sure. sure there's value in every scientific work everybody does, but we have to be open to the fact that there's a strong critique of the claims and the peer review process. So as discerning leaders and uh, consumers of knowledge, we need to be careful, not conflate every data point as the ultimate word in uh, in this research. Be very, very careful. Right, right. No, that, is, that, is, that is my conclusion in this one. Absolutely. I think uh, I think you've you know you've laid out a pretty great case as to why there needs to be so much more nuance and so much more care when we're analyzing data like that. And again, the problem is that you know what happens is we keep following, we keep playing the game in 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 the court or in the playground of the proponents you know the because the proponent says okay we're not playing the linguistics game anymore so we say okay forget linguistics let's go on to the next one they say we're not playing the archaeological game anymore because the archaeological game does not work in our favor so even the indians say okay forget about archaeology or you know at least some of them say so then because we're so focused on genetics and i know we just did an hour and a half podcast on genetics but still the, I, I think it's still important to understand that, you know, the, the methodology is important in genetics, the, you know, uh, how we're studying genetics, all the samples, all of those things are important. But at the same time, it's also very important to look at this problem from a very holistic perspective. It's very important to keep the linguistic uh, evidence, to keep the archaeological evidence, to keep the hydrological evidence, to keep the astronom astronomical evidence. All of that evidence, um, you know, in in conjunction with the linguistic evidence, uh, with the genetic evidence, excuse, excuse me, that is what creates, that is what starts to paint what the real picture is. Because if we're looking at only one facet of the picture, we're not looking at the entire picture. To get the entire picture, we need to look at different parts of the picture and then, you know, build that puzzle. Right now, genetics is only one piece of the puzzle. When we look right. at all the other aspects, that is what starts to create that puzzle, right? Precisely, precisely. And if there's one thing that I'd like uh, readers and viewers to take away from here, it is to question methodology, whether it's astronomy, whether it is uh, genetics, whether it is linguistics, whether anything it's got to do with, they use some analytical methods or the other. And you have to pay the diligence. You've got to go and see what is the data you've admitted, what is the weakness and assumptions of the methodology that you're using. At every point, if you focus attention, you'll understand that claims cannot be so wide, encompassing, and so on. Right. That to be very narrow. You have to make narrow claims yeah. based upon the narrow scope of validity right. of your methodology. Right. That right. is the message I hope that readers and viewers will take away. And right. not be carried away by bombastic claims that the final word on Aryan invasion theory has been done and this is the story right. and a deep right. story. Those are super arrogant right. to come with uh, ideologies like that without even considering even a bit of all of the material that goes against those narrators. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, uh, I just want to reiterate that to people that are watching, I understand that it's okay that you might not, you know, one... Uh, you know, hour and a half long podcast might not completely convince you one way or the other. But what I would, and I think what uh, Dr. Vedam would also recommend is that try to look at the broader picture. I'm not, you know, claiming to be a person that knows this issue inside out. I absolutely don't. That's why I, you know, bring on people like Dr. Vedam and talk to talk about this issue uh, on the show. But what I think is, is, is the best thing to be able to do and the best way to do service to this question is look at all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, don't get entangled in one piece of the puzzle and then, and then again, forget the entire picture. I think it's important to look at the archaeological, linguistic, hydrological, astronomical, all the evidence that is available for uh, the this, this phenomenon that people call the Aryan invasion theory and see how it stacks up to all of the evidence that is available to us. You know, does it, uh, the, because so far there is no evidence to suggest that India's civilization did not originate in India. So... Uh, I think uh, I think that's a that's a good place for us to conclude today's chat as well. And I really want to thank again Dr. Vedam for coming on the show and for uh, enlightening us and you know definitely enlightening me. Thank you very much. And if I may just add one last word, okay. I'd request the viewers to uh, see some of the videos that I have on YouTube. Search for my name Raj Vedam yes. and see some of the more recent ones. The older ones are somewhat a little outdated. 
see the more newer ones where I'm covering some of the data points Sham just talked about in terms of archaeology, in terms of astronomy, in terms of knowledge transfers. And uh, it, it, there's a lot of compilation of data over there that might help you in your own search towards finding the truth. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Please go check out Dr. Raj Vedam's videos on YouTube. They're available on YouTube. They're available on his Facebook page. I will add his Facebook page in the link to the description of this video so you can go on his Facebook page and check out the videos and keep up to date with uh, uh, Dr. Vedam's future events as well so you can follow him there. Again, Dr. Vedam, thank you very much for doing the show today. I really appreciate it. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to subscribe. Uh, I will see you guys again for the next one. And until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon. Namaste. Namaste.